Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be exploring the significance of spiritual epiphanies. My guest is Professor Jeffrey Kripal, who holds the J. Newton Razor Chair in Philosophy and Religious Thought at Rice University. He's currently chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Esalen Institute and the author of many books, including Authors of the Impossible the paranormal and the sacred, mutants and mystics, science fiction, superhero comics and the paranormal, secret body, erotic and esoteric currents in the history of religions. He co-authored with Whitley Strieber, The Supernatural, A New Vision of the Unexplained, about which we've done a previous interview. He co-authored with Elizabeth Crone, Changed in a Flash, One Woman's Near-Death Experience and Why a Scholar Thinks It Empowers Us All, about which we've done a previous interview. His most recent book is called The Flip, Epiphanies of Mind and the Future of Knowledge. Jeffrey's based in Houston, Texas. And now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be with you. It's been a while. <laughs> Likewise, Jeffrey. Yeah, it's been it's been well, kind of pre-COVID, I think, through probably three or four years. It it has been. I know we've talked about uh, Supernature, the book you co-authored with Whitley, and I interviewed the two of you. Uh, we've talked about Changed in a Flash that you wrote with Elizabeth Crone, and I've interviewed the two of you. We did an interview on, on Secret Body. So to the best of my recollection, this would be our fourth interview. Wow. Wow, that's a lot. I, I didn't know that. Well, you've been very busy since we last spoke. I, I know that you've uh, been active at the Esalen Institute. You were the chairman of your department for a while. Mm -hmm. And you had recently a major conference there at Rice University. We did. We Three weeks ago, we, we had a conference called Opening the Archives of the Impossible. And it was about eight months in the making. I mean, it was a tremendous amount of labor and, and organization. Well, I really enjoyed the talk that you gave at that conference, and uh, maybe we'll be able to weave it in to, to this discussion, because ultimately, it seems as if all of this work that you're engaged in, and to some degree I'm engaged in, has to do with a, a major metaphysical shift that's taking place in our culture right now. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. That's the hope. <laughs> that's certainly that's certainly the intention and the hope. And perhaps we can, perhaps you can put the uh, website of the conference in your in your uh, however you do that, because all of the all of the plenaries and panels were recorded and they're all up now, so they're available to anyone who who wants to watch them. Well, what I thought you have a particular bead on is the way in which scholars in the humanities have to come to terms with these metaphysical issues, which are often regarded as somehow not quite part of the humanities or people in the humanities take for granted the basic materialistic bias of the larger Western culture. Well, that's certainly, that's certainly been a major part of my project. I mean, one one works where one is. And I, you know, I began my remarks for the conference just saying, look, I'm a professor, I'm a, I'm a nerd, and I'm going to talk about the academy because that's where we're at for this particular conference. And that's what it's largely about is how do we, how do we mainstream these topics in the gut of the, the American university, um, the American research university. And so that's really what the conference was about. And I, I feel most comfortable when I'm speaking to that because I know where all the lines in the sand are. 
And I know the kinds of knee-jerk responses that intellectuals give to these topics, none of which are convincing or even plausible, but they are what they are, and, and they have to be answered. Um, and so I try to answer them, you know, and I try to, sp I do speak the language of the humanities to other people in the humanities. And we can talk about what the humanities are and why that works so well here. But that's really the, that's really my project. Oh, all right, let's drill down a little bit into that because I'm under the impression that the humanities are heavily influenced these days by postmodernism and, and the idea that basically everything is just a story. The post-structuralist or postmodern turn in the 70s and 80s has really, um, I think, had a, had a necessary and positive effect on it, on the academy, but it's now having a, a quite negative and a, and a destructive uh, effect. And, you know, there are, there's certainly a lot of things, good things to say about that argument. The, the basic argument is that, that there is no objective truth and that truth claims are essentially power grabs they're functions of, of a social group or of a, of a set of individuals, but they don't correspond to anything in reality. Um, that's essentially the postmodern move. Um, and that all language simply refers to other, other language. We're all caught in these webs of words and, and meanings, and meaning is something that just kind of goes around on a web, and it never – you know, it never escapes itself. It never gets out of its own its own web. And so you can do very powerful things with that. And you can show that any any uh, politics or any ideology is essentially constructed. And and so it has a kind of what I call a prophetic edge to it that's extremely valuable. But on the other side of the equation, you will also land in a kind of nihilistic, meaningless universe. And I think people are naturally disillusioned with that. Um, and so I think that's that's really where, where we're kind of at. And I think there, it, there are a number of movements now, not just in, in the public and popular culture, but also in intellectual circles that are trying to move towards um, a different worldview in which truth is maybe not with a capital T, but it's possible to get closer to truth. And it's possible to speak of of the real world and to experience the real world in, in dramatic ways. And I think that's what the, the paranormal phenomena are really about on some level. In your book, The Flip, you talk about people who are hardened materialists, uh, hardened skeptics who are confronted with paranormal experiences that they just can't deny. And, and you look at how uh, they attempt through various strategies to integrate these experiences. I, I've taught at Rice University now for 20 years, and it's very much a STEM-oriented university, which means the sciences, technology, engineering, and mathematics really uh, are at the core of the institution, and it's what most students and most parents want their students or want their children to study. So all my undergraduate students are very much STEM, you know, STEM young people. And when I teach the history of religions or comparative religion and I use kind of traditional religious material, they they quickly dismiss them as, oh, these are these are simply naive people who lived before modernity. They didn't know their science. If they knew their science, they wouldn't say these silly things. Um, you know, it's that kind of thing. It's just that kind of quick. So what, I di what I've done at Rice over the years is I've abandoned, more or less, using traditional religious sources, and I've used the extraordinary experiences of medical doctors and engineers and physicists and then that takes away <laughs> it takes away their knee jerk you know response it's like oh wait a minute this, not only does this person know their physics but he's a, actually a nobel laureate um you know or you know not only is this an engineer but you know he invented x y and z so 
they can't do that anymore and they start to have to force or they start to have to face the facts that scientists and and engineers and medical professionals have these sorts of experiences and do change their mind. Um, so that's that's kind of the origin of the flip. One of the things you point out is that the epiphanies that these people have are also kind of a double-edged sword. On, on the one hand, it opens them up to new interpretations, new experiences, a, a new appreciation of religion, and at the same time, they can also become more critical. Right. These are not, yes, in general, I mean, it, there's a broad spectrum of experiences, but it's extremely common that people who have these experiences do not fit very well into their religious cultures or traditions. And one of the things I found looking at these experiences of, of scientists is that their science works just fine afterwards. They, they realize that actually there's really, you don't need materialism. Materialism is not science. Science is a particular method. It's a way of coming to know the natural world in more and more precise ways. But it actually is not the same thing as materialism, which is an interpretation of the science. And when these scientists abandon their, their materialist interpretation for something that's much more vitalistic or alive or, or consciousness-based, their science still works fine. Um, so to me, that's a real takeaway that it's a kind of both and argument it's not an either or argument i'm not looking at people who turn away from their science and become traditional religious believers that's not the argument the argument is 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 this 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 flip we're talking about it's a kind of both and conclusion well one nobel laureate with whom uh as I recall, you interacted personally as Carrie Mullis, who was largely responsible for the revolution in uh, genetic engineering and gene editing. Yeah, Carrie was a uh, Carrie's no longer with us, um, but I spent three days with Carrie actually in uh, Petaluma, California, at a conference, and I'd written about him, and since then. Uh, he wrote about actually he wrote about his alien abduction uh, in his memoir, um, and I spoke to him for days. He, he and his wife were both there, and he was just adamant about this. And it wasn't that he adopted the the alien hypothesis. That wasn't the point. The point was something very very strange happened on his property, and it didn't just happen to him. It happened to a number of individuals independently on the same property and it just it really um it really moved him in a, in a really profound metaphysical way um but yeah he he invented the um the process that that they later used to to do the human genome pcr pcr i think it's called very profound one of the most valuable uh, scientific and engineering discoveries of the last century, I think. Yeah, well, I mean, he won the Nobel Prize in chemistry in like 93 or 4 or something for it. So, yeah, I mean, again, you just can't make the argument that these are people who don't know their science. They do know their science. Well, one of the other fascinating individuals that you report on is Michael Shermer, who happens to be the... Uh, Managing director, as I recall, of the Skeptical Society and the editor of the Skeptical Magazine, a professional skeptic. Yeah, Michael, you know, I don't know Mr. Shermer um, or Michael. I mean, I think we're essentially peers in the age sense. Um, he's, he's, a, he's brave. You know, I, I admired, I, I wrote about this piece he wrote in the Scientific American. It's fairly short. And it basically involves a paranormal experience he and his his young wife had at, at their wedding on their wedding day that involved a radio, uh, a dead radio going on at, at this very precise time and playing a very precise song that the bride's dead grandfather loved. And, you know, it was and Michael Shermer is very clear that 
there's nothing about the physics of the of the event that was extraordinary. There's nothing extraordinary about a dead radio suddenly playing that we we know the physics of that. We know how that's possible. But it was the timing of it and what it meant to to his bride that was so uncanny and so powerful. And I think that takes us back to the humanities conversation, Jeffrey, where science is actually not the best method, I think, to get at a lot of these experiences. Because the science, the physics or the the chemistry or what have you is often well known. It's it's the meaning that that is being communicated by the timing and by the the synchronicity or the the sort of the magical quality of the events that really speaks to the individuals. And and so meaning and narrative, this gets us into the whole postmodern thing. Th- these are not scientific categories. Scientists don't talk about meaning, uh, he, but but people in the humanities do all the time. That's that's what we're interested in. And so I think I think that's what these events are about. And so I would use if, if, if you know my one piece of advice is use the tool in your toolbox that actually fits the job at hand. Don't don't pull out a screwdriver if you actually need a hammer or a saw. I mean, pull out the right instrument. And I just I think we're pulling out the wrong instruments a lot of the times. How so? Well, we're trying to use I mean I do think you can get something by using the methods of science. Don't get me wrong. I think parapsychology is a really important venture. But what it usually ends up studying is very small um, phenom- very small modes of significance, where the really big kind of robust paranormal stuff inevitably happens during trauma or death or illness or danger. And it becomes a story. It becomes a text or it becomes a podcast interview. It does not – it's not something you can recreate in a laboratory unless unless you – Unless you're really immoral, <laughs> you know. I mean, I suppose if you start killing people, you you can eventually recreate someone. But you know that that's a problem. That's a moral problem. But these events are very common in in kind of you know natural life or natural death. Is is I'm not telling you anything you don't know. I'm just I'm reflecting on why. I think the humanities are so powerful and why the sciences are often the wrong the wrong tool. Well, certainly it's it's the case that in the world of literature there are great writers going back I think probably as far as uh, the novels and, and literary works exist that include elements of, of the paranormal in their writing and uh, it's always difficult for modern interpreters to know did they mean that literally or was it just sort of a uh, an allegory one of the things you hear a lot if you talk to experiencers is they'll say things like it was as if i were in a novel or it was as if i were in a movie and they really mean that they're not they're not being they're not understating the case they're, what they're reporting on is a profound sense that they are kind of caught in a narrative or uh, a story that they themselves are not writing. And I think, you know, this is where I get philosophical. I think we all are, Jeff. I think that's what a culture is. It's a story that you were born into. You didn't choose it. You didn't write it. And yet, you have to suffer it, you know, and sometimes you can draw advantages from it if it if it if the story goes your way, but often the story doesn't go your way, particularly if you're not central or you're a minority or you're you're excluded in some ways from the center of the culture. So I think we're all in stories, and I think that's what a religion is essentially. It's a it's a big big story that people live inside of until they don't of course um and then and then there's a problem and i think that's kind of where we're at in the modern world is in that that kind of and then there's a problem um so i think i think what i'm trying to get at is i think the sense of experiencers that they're caught in a story is actually very accurate 
And I think a lot of paranormal phenomena are precisely about that. They're about waking us up to this notion that we're in a story and that maybe we want to Maybe we don't want to be in that story. Maybe we want to. Maybe we want a different story. And I don't think, by the way, we can live without a story. I think we're going to simply, as a as a community or culture, we're going to invent another story and then live inside of that one. So I'm not. I'm not naive about this. Um, I think the idea that we can live without myths is a, is itself a myth. Uh, I think that's nonsense, actually. Um, so that's that's kind of where I go with all of this and how I try to use the tools of literature and history and the study of religion to think about people's experiences in ways that certainly are not scientific, but also are not anti-scientific. They're just they're just different. Well, you wrote a book about the religion of no religion, uh, focusing in on the Esalen Institute. and. To my knowledge, that's one of the most rapidly expanding groups of people in the population, uh, those who consider themselves spiritual but not religious. And I should think as a professor of religious studies that uh, the implications of that social movement are just enormous. Well, you would think so, wouldn't you? Um, so that demographic is extremely large and growing in people under the age of 30. It, it's, 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 it's really, it's not isolated, but it's focused on younger people. My own sense of it is that it's kind of a placeholder and it's kind of a moral protest. Um, young people are so disgusted with the ex exclusiveness, intolerance, and hatred of some religious traditions that they just basically say to heck with it. I don't want anything to do with it. And I also think, I think the, the rise of the STEM fields, frankly, has led a lot of young people to think materialism somehow has all the answers. And again, I don't equate those two things, but I think they become equated. I think science and materialism become equated in the popular mind. And so I think people assume the questions have been answered and science is our answer, and let's move on. Of course, that's not true, but they don't know that. So I don't know. I, I'm just, I think one of the main responses of people to this material is one of complete and total apathy. And, and I think that's much harder to deal with than someone who says I'm spiritual but not religious. Let me put it that way. Mm. And I get, I get the apathy as much or more than I get the spiritual but not religious, or frankly, the religious. I, I think in some ways, people, young people who are intensely religious are the most rewarding to work with um, because the, the, the most is at stake. If, if, you, if you don't care, nothing's at stake, right? And you're not going to pay attention. But if, if you really care, if you have skin in the game, you're, you're going to listen. You know, it doesn't mean you're going to agree, but you're going to have you're going to have a conversation. Um, so that's been my experience. And by religious, people, you know, true, truly passionate atheists are the same way, frankly. They're as, they're as good as students as anyone because they've thought through the issues. Again, it's the kids, it's the, it's the young people who, who are apathetic that I find the most difficult. Well, I'm assuming, and maybe I'm wrong, that uh, people are apathetic because they get caught up in the consumer culture, which is a form of materialism involved in just accumulating things. And that's what uh, they find of meaning rather than the realm of ideas. I'll defend my students here a little. I... I, th I just think a lot of times they're at a point in life where these are not particularly relevant questions, Jeffrey. You know, they're, they're, eight, they're 18 or they're 19, for goodness sake, and their hormones are raging and they're trying to figure out what they're going to do with their life and how they're going to make a living. And, you know, they're, 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 um, their goals are just different. 
the the religious questions or the philosophical questions why am i here uh, where am i where's this all going what happens to me after i i die what happens to my loved ones after they what happens to my pet when my pet dies i mean you know you've got to kind of live life for a while to come up against the harder questions and even then i think some people are just too busy too too distracted to really think about it much Speaking for myself, I'm 75 years old, and these questions are of paramount importance to me. However, when I was young, when I was an undergraduate, uh, I had a minor flip of my own. I did an undergraduate senior honors thesis at the University of Wisconsin on the psychology of religious mysticism. And I went into it like a typical materialist. I expected I would be writing about various forms of psychopathology that led people to imagine that they were seeing ghosts. And um, I was working along those lines until I encountered the work of Abraham Maslow, who pointed out that some of the healthiest, most productive people in our society had what he called peak experiences that were virtually identical to the classical mystical experiences. And, and they regarded these experiences as being central to the success that they enjoyed in life. And when I encountered that, I really had to rethink my position completely. Well, you were an unusual kid, Jeffrey. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I mean, most young people, of course, would not be interested in, in the psychology of religious mysticism, um, nor would they be open to Abraham Maslow. So, I mean, there was something in you. I'm, I'm just guessing here. There's something in you that was receptive to to these questions at a very early age. Um, you know, Maslow Maslow was really important to early Eslin. I'm sure you probably knew that, but he yeah. he was sort of the spiritual father of of Michael Murphy, one of the co-founders. And Abe, as Mike calls him, you know, used to come to Eslin all the time and essentially coach or mentor Michael in and how, how to help lead or co-lead the, the institute. And his notion of actualization, self-actualization, if you put that together with Aldous Huxley's notion of human potentialities or human potentials, that, that notion of potentially potentials being actualized, I mean, that then becomes the human potential movement. That really becomes kind of the core of, of what was what was exploding at that time. Um so I, yeah, that's great. I mean, that's great. You're reading Abraham Maslow. And what year was that? This is 1969. Lots, a lot was happening. <laughs> yeah. No, it was a time of incredible ferment, as, as a matter of fact, the 60s. But as I recall, now that I think about it, wasn't there a an extraordinary synchronicity that resulted in Maslow sort of dropping in on Esalen quite unexpected? He thought it was like a motel where he could stay for the night. And at the very time when Murphy and Price were having a discussion about the significance of his work. Yeah, it was. I tell this story in the book. It was, it, you know, there was, of course, no Esalen. It was literally a motel on the side of Highway 1. And it was taken over by a, by a Pentecostal group, by the way, uh, on, on Sundays. And the baths were used by the the, Sam, the gay community on 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 the the week weekdays, and so it was this kind of this eclectic mix of people. And Mike and uh, Dick were thinking about starting an institute, and they were having their staff read um, the, what was the book, The Psychology of Being. Yeah, toward a psychology of being. Okay, toward a psychology of being. So the staff, you know, by the staff, I mean five people, you know, five people and Mike and Dick. So seven people were reading Toward a Psychology of Being. And um, Abe and, and his wife, whose name escapes me right now, um, they basically just got tired at night, in the middle of the night, and pulled in the next motel they could find and showed up at the front desk and <laughs> You know, the staff was just like, oh, my God, we conjured them. You know, here we're reading, we're reading Abraham Maslow and he, he appears, he appears at the front desk. So, yeah, that was that was early, 
early kind of pre esalen Well, an experience like that seems so very magical. Uh, how how would you, as a humanistic scholar, begin to uh, come to terms with that? Well, you wouldn't. I mean, um, you'd just call it a, a coincidence and um, and move on. You know, you you would say that people made meaning out of it, but it itself had no meaning in itself. It was just a, a historical coincidence. Do you really buy that? No, of course not. I mean, that's <laughs> that, that's not my position at all. I'm telling you what. A typical academic would do with that. That's all. Well, how do you interpret it? I think history is very weird. And I think causality, frankly, goes from the future to the past as well as from the past to the present. I think it moves in both directions. And I think human beings are kind of tapped into levels of, of reality that we don't understand and that those then manifest as, as these weird historical synchronicities that we're talking about now. Um, I mean, there, there clearly are also coincidences, Jeffrey, right? I mean, I, I don't, I, I'm not, I don't think we want to deny that, but sometimes the bar just gets so high. The coincidence becomes so coincidental that you're just like, okay, something's going on, you know? And I do think something's going on. Um, and I think it's something we don't understand. Um, I think, again, this is going to get philosophical, but it'll be very familiar to you. I think we assume that as subjects, we're some kind of ghost in this machine. We're kind of subjective thoughts inside a skull, even though I don't know where I am. I mean, I couldn't place myself. Um, and that nothing that goes on in, in here has anything to do with what goes on out there. I think that's our assumption and that we kind of, we kind of move through the physical world um, with really no relationship between the subjective and the objective. And the objective is what the sciences study. It's, it's, it's real. And the subjective is what literature or philosophy or religion study. And it's not real. And I think what's so special about these synchronicities or these historical events is that that doesn't work anymore, right? I mean, clearly the interior event of consciousness is somehow connected to what's happening in the physical environment. And that just completely baffles us uh, and breaks down this notion that, that the subject has nothing to do with the object. And, and I think that's why these events are so challenging to people who think about them, because it just totally violates how we think the world works or what we think a human being is. Now, I know all such experiences aren't as positive as uh, the time that Abraham Maslow magically showed up at what eventually became the heart of the human potential movement. You obviously have worked closely with Whitley Strieber, who, whose experiences, he describes them in a positive light, uh, referring to his uh, alien encounters as, as a communion, but actually they're quite negative in many respects. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah, I mean, one of the first things you learn when you study religion is that a religious experience isn't necessarily good. You know, the, the to encounter some kind of sacred presence can elicit terror and fear and even death as easily or as much as it can elicit joy or, or, or reverence or, or redemption of some kind. So I, I, I personally think that that numinous presence is the same in both instances, but the human being is responding to it in radically different ways and that the fear or the reverence really are human responses to the same kind of presence. Um, and that presence may in fact be us, by the way, I, I'm not, I, I'm not putting that off the table, but if you're, if, if you're, let me put it this way. If you're Jeffrey Mishlov or, or Jeffrey Kripal and you're totally invested in your ego and in your stable social identity, and you are sucked into some kind of larger, entity or consciousness that is not Jeffrey Mishlow or Jeffrey Kripal at all, you, you might find that ecstatic 
and salvific. Or you might find that freaking terrifying and awful. And so I I think it depends on the person. Um, and I do not equate, you know, anomalous phenomena with with morality or with, with the good. Um, I just, I think that's really naive. In fact, you point out that uh, amongst the people you write about who have had these marvelous spiritual epiphanies, it didn't necessarily make them better people. Well, and often it's more radical than that, Jeff. It's also that, you know, when I sit down with an experiencer who wants to tell me their, their story, um, I'm, all, I'm listening for two things. One is sexuality, which always somehow shows up, often in a very strange way. And the other one's trauma. And I find over and over again, not always, but often enough, that there's some serious trauma somewhere in the person's life that somehow opened them up. You know, the, there might have been some sexual abuse, there might have been physical abuse, there might have been a war experience, there might have been a severe illness or a strike on the head or something. But that the person, the people themselves will often trace their abilities or their new life back to that event. And, and so I think there's something about being split open that is really significant. And again, doesn't have to result in these. I mean, it can just be devastating and destructive, but it sometimes does. Back to the example of Abraham Maslow showing up magically at, at Esalen. I, from my point of view, that experience resonates with many I've had my whole life where I've felt guided to pursue the, the career that's brought me to this moment with you. And uh, it's, as I look back on those experiences, it seems to me that there was something about my intention at the time, and or the intention of Michael Murphy and Dick Price at at the moment that Esalen uh, was really founded, you might say, at the moment that Maslow showed up at their doorstep, that they were intending something that became the Human Potential Movement, uh, which which is an, of enormous significance. In my case, my intention led to the only doctoral diploma that says parapsychology that's ever been awarded in the United States. So it's it's something of, of significance. And, and my own gut feeling is that when you intend to um, become I, what I say is the best version of yourself, that there are invisible forces that want to help you. The one thing I would add to that is I don't think intention or what we might call will only works in one way. I think it, we also backwards will. We, we also will ourselves from the future. And, and, I, and I really mean that. I, I think what we call causation is, is really complicated. And I think we're, we're essentially hyperdimensional beings that, you know, are really, we're influencing things from, backwards to forwards, but also forwards to backwards. Um, and I say that because, well, I've just heard too many stories, you know, of precognition, which don't make much sense unless you think of, along these lines. Or I've even heard a lot of stories of people visiting themselves, you know, their their older self will show up and <laughs> visit their younger self. And I'm like, whoa, that's, that's intense. Um, but I, I believe these people. I don't think they're making this stuff up. I think those things really happen. And, and that implies some kind of, some kind of backwards causation or, or, or backwards willing. From a religious perspective, in terms of uh, what is sometimes called the primordial tradition or the perennial philosophy, there is this notion of uh, the end of time. And, and the idea, I think, for example, Matthew Fox has written a book about the, the coming of the cosmic Christ. And I think what he means is that at the end of time, we are all embraced in the love of Christ. And, uh, that Maybe that has a sort of uh, teleological effect pulling humanity forward. We call that eschatology, the study of religion. And most religious systems have <clears throat> some kind of 
eschatology. The, the, again, there's a sort of positive version of that, and there's a negative version, Jeffrey. I mean, the negative stop version is that eschatologies are often pretty nasty. You know, they're nasty to everyone who's not in that group. Um, on the other side, I would say a near-death experience, of which I know you know a great deal, is also a kind of eschatology, and it's a kind of it's a kind of future that's sort of reaching back again into, into the present and changing it. So the telos or the you know the, that's an Aristotelian term, by the way. This sort of this sort of cause that has an end or a goal to it. We assume that it goes in this direction, but what if it also goes in this direction? You know, as it's, you know, it pulls as you as in your language it it pulls us towards itself. That's a different way of thinking and. I think as long as we're aware of the very dangerous ways that the end of the world have, has been used in 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 human civilizations of all kinds, um, I think we can we can think with that. Um, so I don't I, I, I'm very much drawn to eschatological visions, which I think, you know, there's, there's sort of a, a big eschatology about the universe, but then there's a little eschatology about a human life. And, and so images and experiences of death often have these, these same sort of themes in them. Well, whether it's positive or negative or mixed, uh, you seem to be suggesting that there's something about the what we might call the larger self, the higher self of each individual that uh, you used the word earlier, hyperdimensional, that we have a hyperdimensional self that may have all sorts of powers that we in our ego uh, state don't appreciate. Oh, I think so. I mean, I am saying that. But I'm also, I'm, but the, I'm saying that human beings are not fully conscious of themselves. And that, that, yes, they have these capacities or this this vast cosmic reach, but they also have this capacity to do really negative things to themselves and to other human beings. Um, so I, it's complicated. But I think once you move into that, that, that argument that the human being is not just the embodied social ego, that is this kind of hyperdimensional vastness, then a lot of things suddenly open up. And and things that that you didn't take seriously now you do, and and life becomes richer. You know the things becomes more complex. Now I'm a, a big fan of the idea of hyperspace, and I would think that some of your STEM students who are into mathematics would would take an interest in the mathematics of higher dimensional space and and the implications thereof for. Uh, not only consciousness, but things like space travel. I mean, I'm sure they are. I mean, that that's idea goes back to Edwin Abbott, actually, you know, and the development of hyperdimensional geometry in the, in the 19th century. And essentially what Abbott was doing in his book called Flatland was what, was, was what you just said. He was offering a mathematical model of transcendence, essentially. But what's interesting, Jeff, is if you read that book, and I'm not sure who reads it. <laughs> I'm not sure anybody reads anything anymore, actually. <laughs> but if you actually read Flatland or at least listen to the thing, you know, on your commute or something, about two-thirds of that book is actually a pretty robust critique of British class society. So he's using transcendence not just to do theology, he's also using a transcendence to do social critique. And to me, that's really interesting. That's kind of, that's where I would want to go with a lot of this stuff, actually, is, is I, do, I do think people are, are making kind of unconscious critiques of, of their, their own societies, even when, as they're also having these experiences of transcendence. In your book, The Flip, the last chapter addresses exactly this. You're looking at the political and social implications of these epiphanies. Yeah, I'm, I'm very concerned about that because 
I personally think a lot of our political and social problems are functions of our really bad metaphysics. Um, people assume that they are their stories. They assume that they are a, a, a Christian or a Hindu or a Muslim or whatever it is they were, whatever story they were born into. They just they, they conflate that cultural story with themselves. When people flip, they realize that they're not those stories. They were born into them, but actually they're not. They're not the same thing as the story. And so I personally think that has profound political consequences um, and largely positive consequences. But I'm not so naive to think that the religions and the, the cultures and the nation states won't fight back, you know, won't have their own immunological responses to those flips. Um, and so that's what that last chapter is about, is, is both – the moral and political implications of the flip, but also the way the way they these will be resisted, um, and of course are resisted. And if you look in the news today, you know, particularly very conservative political people are very concerned about academics, <laughs> and I think rightly so. I mean, <laughs> yes, we we actually are saying that this is constructed and not really real and not the way things have to be. That That's actually what they really are saying. So it matters is, is what I'm trying to say. It's not, it's not just a, a game. It's not just academic as people say too loosely. It's the ideas people have actually matter uh, and they matter a great deal. Um, so that's that's part of the argument, too. I know back in the 1960s, even when I was an undergraduate, well, there was a very strong sense uh, at the University of Wisconsin, where I was then, that education itself was a subversive activity. Well, I think it is. I mean... You know our our uh, our uh, you know our ancient Greek icon Socrates was put to death for you know um, basically subverting the children of of Athens. I mean, okay, well that that's a significant story right there. Um, there is something really subversive about higher education, and in particular the humanities, by the way. Like I often joke with my scientific colleagues, you know, you guys are not hard. It's these these are not the hard sciences. That this is easy. It's easy to manipulate material reality and measure it and make predictions. You want something hard? Try studying human beings. Try studying living human beings. I'll show you hard. And so I think. We've just kind of reversed what's actually true, you know. Studying the external world of matter is the easy part, and trying to figure out the interior subjective part of human beings is, is in fact, the hard part because we ourselves are embedded in the study, right? It's consciousness studying consciousness. I mean, it's really flippy. Um, and, and that's that's where it becomes really hard, and the stakes go way, way up. And, and I suppose one might say the Heisenberg uncertainty principle applies in spades because er, every new idea changes exactly what you're studying. I mean, Heisenberg, that, that whole thing is interesting because we had that in the humanities decades before in in the sense of what we called hermeneutics. And you know, hermeneutics, it, it means interpretation, but it doesn't actually. It means something like be, being aware that the way you interpret a text or a story or a culture will, in fact, not only change the text or the culture or the story, but will also change the interpreter. There's no, there's no Archimedean point, you know. The act of interpretation involves the interpreter, and the interpreter is changed as well as that which – is being interpreted. That that was sort of basic, you know, before before Heisenberg came on the on the um, on the scene. With regard to what 
people call the paranormal, and I'm perfectly comfortable with that word. In fact, I, while we bring it up, you go into some length to talk about the origins of the word the, the paranormal and, and how it's changed over time. Let, let's go into that a little bit. I, I get This is where I get crabby. Maybe you want me to be crabby. Um, people will often say, well, we shouldn't use the word paranormal. And and I'm like, okay, well, what do you think it means? What do you think we should say? And then they said, I'm like, but that's what they meant when they coined the word paranormal. I mean, they they don't even – this is where I get crabby. People are not aware how sophisticated a word it was when it was – it was coined in 1903 by a, a, a French uh, a psychologist, Paranormal, and – he was clearly riffing on the English supernormal, Jeffrey. He was he was he was reading Frederick Myers, is I'm sure what he was doing. But what what they meant by it, they were resisting the category of the supernatural. You know, the, the Christian category of the supernatural is that there's some kind of agency from outside the natural world that intervenes in the natural world and creates a miracle. Right. That's the notion of the supernatural. That's what people like David Hume were, were 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 so much against. But that is not what they meant by the paranormal. They meant some aspect of the natural world, perfectly natural, perfectly normal or perfectly in the natural world, which we didn't have any understanding of. That's what they meant. So they were studying things like poltergeist phenomena. And they were basically arguing, these are not these are not acts of God. These are not agencies outside the natural world. This is this is the natural world of matter and and space behaving in ways that we do not understand. Um, and so para just meant to the side of. It didn't mean beyond or outside of. It meant to the side of our, our, our normal understanding. So that that's what the word meant originally. And then as it gets abused in the 20th century, I mean, it ends up in your mega bookstore aisle, meaning something like supernatural romance or something, you know. Um, I mean, as a complete debasement of, of the original, frankly, academic word. Um, the other thing I get a lot is that the paranormal is normal, and I just say no, it's not. That that's not that's not right. If somebody has a paranormal experience; it might be the single most significant thing that ever happened to them. They've forgotten the other million things of their life, and they remember that one thing. It's paranormal precisely because it stands out. That's precisely what makes it paranormal: is that. It's trying to communicate something to the person. And to, and to communicate with someone, guess what? You have to get their attention. And you have to do something really wild, usually. And I think that's what paranormal phenomena are doing. They're trying to get our attention. They're trying to, like, slap us around and wake us up. And so to call them normal, to me, is just it's just wrong and it's it's just to reduce them again to something we understand and we don't we just don't so stop saying that you know stop saying they're normal and stop saying that they're supernatural because that's not what these people meant by the word there is a big effort in amongst people in the field of parapsychology to come up with words that don't have a stigma attached so non-local is now becoming popular I get so upset with that, Jeffrey. I, you know, it's like UFOs becoming UAPs. I, I just want to gag, you know. I, or they, or they won't call psychedelics psychedelics. They want to because of of the the countercultural baggage. I'm like, that's not baggage. That's part of what they are. Let's embrace that history. Let's not deny it. Psychedelics actually a really good word. Um, so is UFO, even if it's got all the sci-fi stuff going. I mean, that's precisely why it's a great word. And um, I, I always tell this story when I when I was a kid, and by a kid I mean at four. <laughs> I would go fishing with my dad, and and um, I always loved these fluorescent worms in his tackle box. 
and I wanted to use them, you know, as my bait. And of course, I never caught anything ever. And dad would say, now, Jeff, you've got to use the bait the fish want and not the bait you want. And to me, that's that's kind of really what we're talking about here is if you're a writer or a filmmaker or you want to communicate with people, you need to use words that can draw them in. You don't want to use words that are so technical or so safe that they mean nothing. You know, like what what the heck does UAP mean? You know, I mean, come on. Non-local is okay, by the way. I kind of like that. But that's why they invented Psy, by the way, too, of course, right? Mm -hmm. They were trying to come up with something um, safe. And uh, I just don't think there's anything safe about this stuff. <laughs> well, there is always, every generation seems to come up with new words. But one of the intriguing things to me, one of my professors when I was at Berkeley was C. West Churchman, who was a pioneer in systems theory. And uh, his classic book was called The Systems Approach and Its Enemies. And, and he used to... Uh, argue that the enemies are just as important as the systems approach. If you're a systems theorist, uh, when it comes to the paranormal, the enemies are very, very powerful. We have, on the one hand, the, the rationalists, materialists who say this stuff doesn't exist at all. On the other hand, the traditionalists who say, yes, it exists and it's demonic, it's evil, it should be avoided. So naturally, any new breakthrough in, in the paranormal field is going to awaken the ire of these two very powerful enemies. Yeah, I mean, it's neither religion or science in the, in the kind of conventional senses. And I, I think that's right. I, I also think you can give too much power to skeptics or debunkers. Um, I mean, if if you always think there's exactly two sides of an issue – then, you know, you have matter and antimatter and you end up with absolutely nothing at the end. I don't actually think there's a counterposition to some of this stuff. Um, there's, you can make up a counterposition, but I don't think it's plausible. So I, you know, not every debate is real, Jeffrey, um, or is worth having, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Because it wastes a lot of time and sucks up a lot of oxygen. And Good questions and good critical questions are important, but people who are ideologically committed to a, a materialist worldview are really not that interesting. I mean, I can tell you what they think before they open their mouths. You know, that's not thinking. You know, that's some kind of automaton. Um, so... And the same is true with believers, by the way. I'm not. I, I don't want to put it, get, get people off the hook here. I mean, if I if someone can predict what you're going to say, you're not really thinking. You're just you're just you're just being an automaton. From a political point of view, the automatons seem to be running the show. <laughs> well, that's true. Yeah, don't, I don't know. I don't know if I should go that way, but. Uh... <laughs> You began or you concluded your book by addressing politics. I did. I did. I tried not I tried not to make everything about politics, but I think our political and social lives are really important. And I think these experiences have political and social implications. And, and I want people to really struggle with that. Um, like, you know, go back to Elizabeth Crone, the book Change in a Flash. I mean... One of the things that really fascinated me about Elizabeth was, you know, she's struck by lightning in the parking lot of her synagogue, and she has this near-death experience. And But what was so interesting and, and was so genuine about Elizabeth's response to that was it put her at odds with every form of Judaism that she knew about. It did not sit well with either her kind of um, liberal or reform Judaism or her Hasidic conservative Judaism she also knew about. I mean, there were different elements that worked in each of those traditions really well, but 
her all the elements of her experience could not be slotted in, in any single Jewish tradition. And I found that fascinating uh, and really honest. And, and, and of course, that plays out in different ways with different people's experiences. Uh, it's the same with like reincarnation memories, which I'm sure you're well aware of. It's they don't always behave. They don't always appear in cultural contexts where they make sense. They often appear in cultural contexts where they don't make sense, where they're they're deeply offensive, frankly. Well, it seems the paranormal in general seems to defy all of our rational systems. And I think that's its point. I think that's one of its points. And, and that's why I'm very much against explaining it. Because, A, I don't think it can be explained. But also, B, I think the message is, that we're more than our explanations, that the the world is not just rational or explainable in a in a in a kind of cognitive sense. Um, the, this this trickster element, which you're very aware of, I mean, I I think it's it, this elusive element of these phenomena. I think are part of their message. I don't think we ever remove that elusiveness. We 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 we're not capable of it. Well, that's a very profound thought, uh, especially because I think in the history of philosophy, every time you run up against a paradox of, of some sort, there's an effort to achieve what I might call a meta stance that can resolve the paradox. Yeah, you know, I, I just don't believe that. Um, I have a colleague here I, I talk about. I talked about him at the conference, actually. Alexander Regier is his name. And he wrote this beautiful book on uh, German and British Romanticism. He, he's in literature here. He's in our Department of, of, of English. But he has this wonderful phrase. I think he probably got it from someone else. But I find it so useful here. He, it's called The Tyranny of Clarity. And the idea is it's actually a romantic critique of the Enlightenment. And basically what it argues is that you know, whatever life is, it's not clear. And if you make it clear, you've, you're clearly not talking about whatever life is. <laughs> you know, the, the, there's the idea that we can make sense of things is itself a kind of tyranny and a, and a kind of mistake. Um, and I actually really, that's been my experience, Jeff. I mean, as when I work with experiencers or again, you know, if we would have been having this conversation 25 years ago or 30 years ago, I think the message I would communicate is, well, if we just think about this stuff long enough, we'll figure it out. You know, we'll we'll explain it. Gosh, darn it. You know, and now I'm like, no, well, <laughs> that's not going to happen. You know, so the, the more someone tells me their story, actually, the less sense it makes. And and I know when they tell me the story for the first time that they're only telling me the parts that are presentable and make some sense. And that if they tell me a little more, it'll get stranger and then it'll strain. And so it never it never clarifies. Let me put it that way. It always it always becomes stranger and and more trickster like. It's as if at the, at the base is something that is so. Unknowable, one might say God or the deity or, or something that's beyond all conception. It's both wonderful and horrific. And uh, we make up stories in a way to protect ourselves from the awesomeness of it. Yeah, no, we do. But on the other hand, I, I mean, this is kind of behind your question. On the other hand, it's trying to talk to us. And so we should be listening. And we should be talking back. You know, it, it's trying to have a conversation. So it can be engaged to a certain point. Uh, and by the way, Jeff, I think it, I think it is us. Um, and I don't mean us. I don't mean Jeff or Jeff. I, I, I mean <laughs> some really weird, really cosmic collective being. I, I think that's really what's trying to communicate with us through these events. And I think it's calling us out of our our dysfunctional 
beliefs and, and reasons and worldviews, and it's calling us towards some other beliefs or reasons that are that are that are better. They're not they're not complete and they're not perfect and they're not final, but they're better. Um, and that's I, I if that's not the case, I don't know why we're talking right now, frankly. I, I don't know why any of us are doing this. Like why why? Why are you doing that? You know, so I mean I think if you're engaged with this material, you you do you do think that or believe that on some level. For sure. Well, Professor Jeffrey Kripal, once again, what a wonderful conversation. I've missed uh, having these dialogues with you, and I hope that we can schedule more in the future. Yeah, it's lovely. It's lovely to talk to you again, Jeff. Thank you so much for being with me today. Sure. Absolutely. Thank you. And for those of you listening or watching, thank you for being with us as well. Thank you.